You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore data. Well, what do we do today? Do we talk about Aaron Rodgers for a half hour or what? I'm, I don't know. I think we're all kind of burnt out on it. Um, supposedly, today's the day, just like supposedly last week was the day, just like supposedly two weeks ago today was the day. Um, do I think it's today? Yeah, but the fact that <laughs> it's there's got to be a name for this. There's some kind of a psychological torture that takes place that has a name that's very, excuse me, excuse me. Today was a good day. I didn't, uh, I didn't sleep through, hey, 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 slow down now, dropping my phone all over. I didn't sleep through all my alarms, so it's possible we might get interrupted by a couple alarms. I had a, I had a small victory today. It was, it was actually kind of a, I'm taking credit for the victory, but it was actually kind of an accident. I was so tired when my first alarm went off, I like, it, I panicked for some reason. I don't know if I was having a weird dream or something, but I snapped out of bed. And when I was in the sitting up position, I'm like, yeah. do I want to like, I mean, I definitely want to go to bed, but it's one thing to, it's almost like when I hit snooze, it's like, I didn't hear it. I'm like, no, I don't know. I'm, t- I'm so tired. I don't know what's going on. Oh, snooze. Got to swipe to the right to snooze. Okay. Okay. You're going back to bed. I don't know. I'm, I'm so delirious. But when you're halfway in like the standing position, you got a conscious, like I, I snap my phone up, like I'm, I'm starting to get the process of like rushing out of my bed, almost like something in my brain was like, dude, you're late for work. And so it's like, am I going to do the overt act of, of being like, I am going to set my phone down, plug it in, lay down, get under the covers and fall asleep. And I'm like, no, just get up, stupid. So it's a little extra painful, but um, again, I'm, I'm counting that as a win even if it was an accidental win. But look, there, there's, there's so much information out there, and it's just kind of got my head spinning, probably for all of us. And I've, I've talked before about how I was like 95% sure that this is basically a done deal, Rodgers is coming back. And then you just start seeing, all, and, and we've learned that all these reports are fake, but I still somehow get sucked in, even as I'm saying, that ain't real. I still find myself going, I don't know what he's going to do, man. He might actually, what if he goes? Like, he might go. What's he waiting for? He's going to retire. I mean, not retire. He's going to go to, to Denver or maybe it's somebody said Tennessee, even though I already heard that that's not a thing, but maybe that was fake. And I don't remember. I'm, I'm kind of confused and I don't know what's happening anymore. Same with Devante. I, <laughs> I said, you know, today's the last day of the, uh, of the tag and I'm sitting here saying they have to do it today. What are they doing? It's, it's going to happen. It has to be today because there's no other. And then it just dawned on me, didn't you say a couple months ago there's no way they're going to franchise tag Devontae Adams? Now, I understand that you can still tag him and come to some kind of an agreement. And so it's kind of just a, a, a safe thing just to make sure. But it wasn't that long ago I was confident that the Packers weren't going to use a tag. And, um, you know, it, it, it's it's something where I have an assumption that something's going to happen based on no real information from the team. And I get stuck in that. It's like, why do you think they're going to tag him? It's like, well, because everybody knows that they're, he's going to get tagged. How do you know? What did the team say? Well, uh, I don't remember them talking about it, honestly. But everybody knows, which is crazy because, again, there's a lot of parallels in life and everything else. I won't get specific because it can take us down some rabbit holes that we don't really need to go down, but. Just this thing where we start to believe with all our heart and all our mind really firmly something because everybody just knows it. Well, how do you know? Well, I don't know, because I heard it. Everybody on Twitter says it. Everybody in the media says it. Yep, there we go. There's my second alarm. Now is the time when lazy me is like, oh, I got to get up. That's like the last one, like the last official one. And then it's just a bunch of snooze alarms and it's like, fine. But you know what I mean? It's just everybody says it. And every, you know, all the news is saying it, so it must be true. But how do you know? Other than other people told you, and the logical fallacy known as the appeal to authority, how do you know? You don't know. You don't know jack squat. And when you put your own brain to it, if you've even tried that, what do you come up with? 
Maybe you don't have to trust yourself, but what else are you going to do? Thinking for yourself and being wrong is better than letting other people think for you. Let's put it that way. And again, you can appeal to authority all you want, but I, I promise you, no matter what issue we're talking about, find an authority that believes something, and I'll find an authority that believes something different. On literally every issue, I will find a PhD who is a lot smarter than you and a lot smarter than me that thinks something different. So what good is that? It's kind of funny, too, if you think about it. And we're, we're again, we're, we're down the rabbit hole now. But I've thought about this. This would actually be bonus podcast material. Maybe I should just save this for that. But it is a little bit interesting if you think about it. I believe something because the authorities say so. Well, not all authorities. No, but like those, the ones that I listen to do. So it's not even the authorities you're listening to. It's, it's what you want to believe. But you're not even basing what you believe on what you think because you're not thinking. You're believing in authorities, but you're choosing which authorities to believe in. So really, you, you have made up your own mind on what's going to happen whether it be with the Packers or anything else. And you're kind of just using the authorities as cover and as an excuse to believe it without thinking about it, which is really crazy. I don't have to think because I've (laughs) selected authorities to tell me what to think, but really I've pre-selected them based on what I want to think, even though I haven't thought about it. It's it's freaking weird. Anyways, as I said, wasn't very long ago, I thought there's no chance Devontae's leaving. He's not going to get tagged. Rodgers is coming back. We're good. And honestly, the, the, the other thing is when you look at the team, again, I don't know what's going to happen. He may get tagged today. Rodgers may go somewhere else. Rodgers may retire. I don't know. But the one thing I know about the Packers is we panic and they don't. We believe they have to tag Devontae because if they don't, then maybe they won't come to an agreement and Devontae will leave. We, many of us, myself included, believed after the report about Rodgers last year that we should probably trade him before the draft or maybe after the draft, it doesn't matter. Because if he leaves and we get nothing, we're doomed, right? We panicked. All the what-ifs started to flood into our brain, and it's like, I'm not dealing with this. Just get rid of him. Let's just take what we can get. He said, dude, he says he's going to retire. We can't allow that. We're going to get nothing for him right now. He just won MVP. Like, I'm freaking out. Packers are like, nah. It's like, well, what are you going to do? Nothing. It'll be fine. What if he retires? Yeah, that's fine, but he won't. Well, how do you know? We don't. Well, then what? <laughs> It's not even my job on the line as GM, and I'm freaking out, and, and Gutekunst is just like, I don't know. And what happened? Rodgers put up a fight. We listened to the media say that Rodgers has the team by the neck. Rodgers has him right where he wants him. Rodgers is in complete control. And at the end, Rodgers came crawling back. <laughs> yeah, but he got, uh, he got Randall Cobb. He did. He got his precious Randall Cobb. That was, that was wonderful, wasn't it? He sure won that battle. Way to go. And we're hearing it all over again. They got the team, but this team is getting whipped. But have you ever seen them in, well, maybe Matt LaFleur. He looks a little panicked. He would go to the podium and be like, please don't leave. I don't know what we're going to do. But you talk to Gutekunst, he's like, I don't care. But if he leaves, yeah, that would suck. You know, you got to do what you got to do, but we'll uh, we'll find another quarterback. He didn't say that, but I mean, that's that's kind of, that's just the vibe Gutekunst gives out. Maybe he's just a really good negotiator that way, show no fear. But at the end of the day... We're going to find out today how they actually feel about... Like, is, is he actually just massively confident? Or is it kind of just for show and they're about to tag the dude right now? Because today is drop-dead day for panic time. And it'll probably give us a, an indication of how the, the talks are going. Because, again, there's conflicting reports with Devontae. Some people are saying that, you know, the, the talks are going well. Some people are saying there are no conversations being had. Some people are saying there are conversations, but they're not going well. Well, if there's a chance that Devontae's about to walk out the door, unless the Packers are just that anti-franchise tag, which as we know, they really don't ever use that. But these are different times. We don't usually have, I mean, generally speaking, Devontae would have had a contract last year. That's the way they normally do stuff. Prior to the season last year, this guy would have got a massive contract. He didn't, probably for all the reasons that these are different times. And as a result, you have a superstar at 29 years old, best wide receiver in football, the exact kind of guy the the Packers never let leave. And this is the last day to officially say, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know you're not leaving. It's the last day to say that. And if they don't do that, it means one of two things. Number one, they are unbelievably confident that they will get a, a, a deal done. Number two, they know that either we can pay you this and you're going to accept it, or you, you're going to leave and we're okay with that. 2B is we can't really afford the franchise tag anyways. So again, You can either take what we can offer you, or you're just going to have to move on. But even then, it's like, how about a tag and trade, dude? We can get something for him if you tag him. 100%. 
I don't know what, because, you know, I'm assuming you get a decent haul for it. So you tag him, and then you... So yeah, the, I, I don't see anything other than if he doesn't get tagged today, they're just like, we got it. We're good. We got this. He's not leaving. It's all media nonsense and everything else, and he's going to be back. It's the only conclusion I can come to. Why wouldn't you do it? Again, I panic. They don't panic. I don't know why they don't panic. Maybe they do and they just don't show it, but I panic. I also, I, I also have a daily podcast and no real information, so I have nothing to do except spin my wheels around and round and round. I have no information except bad information. That's literally all I have is bad information. And so as much as, you know, the Matt LaFleurs and Brian Gutekunst and Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams of the world, um, if and when they hear people like me roll their eyes and say, what an idiot, dude, I got nothing else. I got nothing to work with. You don't like it, come on the show. Tell me what's going on. I'll stop saying it. I know that's not going to happen, but again, until that happens, I I just got to work with what I got to work with here. I mean, all right, I, I, you know, I'm not going to get Rodgers or Devontae, but, uh, you know, maybe Cole Van Lannon, you know. I think, I'm, I think I've earned Cole Van Lannon at this point, okay? I'm not Pat McAfee, but come on. Kylan Hill? I, I, think, I, I think I've earned Kylan Hill. Just, just to, you know, I'm a fan of his. I've been hyping him up. In all honesty, I, I still think it would be better to have people on that I've, I've not been super friendly to. I just think it would make for good inter- Like, who wouldn't want to? Here's the thing. What do you think would happen for the numbers? Who would be like two equivalent guys? Um, Shannon Sullivan or Kevin King? It's a little bit unfair because you can maybe say King is, but I, th- I think they're somewhat equivalent in terms of fan preference or um, status, NFL status. Point is, though, everybody knows that I've had some opinions of Kevin King and have said some things about the guy on the show. And if you saw that he was on the show, I would assume that everybody would be like, Dude, I can't wait to listen to Kevin King just tell this guy he's a freaking idiot. I mean, not because I dislike him, but it's just going to be funny, hilarious entertainment. And I agree, it would be. I got to work on that. Be like, hey, Billy Turner, what's up, man? I've been telling everyone you're a little bit overrated. You want to come on my podcast and tell me why I'm wrong? And by a little overrated, I'd maybe, maybe kind of take a little bit off in this message. <laughs> what are we talking about right now? Oh, yeah, I have no information spinning my tires. Okay. Anyways, um, so today, today, I mean, today is a big day. What, whether, whether anything happens or doesn't happen, it's kind of a big deal, right? Because we've kind of crossed a line here. And so if this day concludes and Rodgers isn't even on McAfee and we haven't heard anything, um, doesn't give us a massive amount of information on Rodgers other than, again, we're kind of drifting further away from this is a done deal and he's staying in Green Bay because it doesn't make a lot of sense. Some people have speculated that it has to do with Devontae trying to keep the pressure on them, but I don't think this is helping Devontae is the problem. I think what would help Devontae is for Rodgers to make a decision. Because once Rodgers makes a decision, the Packers can then figure out what to do with Devontae, or at least have a clearer picture. I'm not entirely sure how him saying, I'm not going to come back until Devontae gets a deal, is helping. Unless we want to do this in reverse. I mean, if that's what they're saying, then fine, we're going to work out a deal with Devontae. But Devontae is the one I'm sure that's saying no to the deal. So what, what are we talking about here? I guess that would put the pressure on the Packers to bring him back, but what if they just can't? I mean, if Devontae's, let's just say, sitting at 28 and Rodgers is like, I'm not coming back until you sign him, and they're like, all right, we got to do a deal here, Devontae, and he's like, well, I'm not budging off 28, then I guess none of you are coming back. I don't know what to tell you. And again, I just, I don't think that's it. I don't think that has anything to do with it. I don't think Rodgers is doing that. I heard somebody speculate that maybe they want to be like a package deal somewhere. It's like, you know, this kind of stuff is stupid to me. I just don't think this is things that NFL players really do. You know, Gronk went back to Tampa, I get that, but they didn't leave and say, we're, we're a team or we're not. No, Tom did what he felt was best for himself. And then he asked Gronk, hey, do you want to come out of retirement and come play? And he's like, man, for you, yeah, let's go win a Super Bowl. That's a different thing. Devontae's looking to make a really major life decision. He wants to be in the right place and he wants to make the maximum amount of money. There's, I, I don't think there's anything in, as far as ranking his priorities, I would say unbelievably low on that list is make sure wherever I go, Rodgers is there. I just think we, we buy in too much to that kind of stuff. I think that's silly. They're friends. They don't have to be like best friends holding hands in the locker room all day long. Especially since it's going to lower the overall price for each of them. When you offer something as a package deal, the price comes down. It doesn't go up. It's not like, oh, if we get both, we're going to offer both of them more money. No, it's going to be less money and probably less compensation for the Packers. So again, I think a lot of this is just romanticizing silliness, and I, I don't know. We'll see what happens. 
The, the other thing I think we need to be prepared for for the Aaron Rodgers situation is we may get an answer and it'll provide us almost no clarity. I mean, don't get me wrong. If he says, I have decided to come back, that's, that's, that's a lot of information. But it's not going to heal us from this ailment of wondering what is going to happen, right? Because it, it, immediately after that, what we are going to start doing is rather than saying, yay, we figured it out, we can move on to something else or just stop talking about it. No, what's going to happen now is what's the contract? How much? How long? He's not going to answer that. He's not going to be like, well, I've decided to stay. I've worked out a deal with the Packers. I'm going to be here for two years at this much of my base salary. And he's not doing that. In fact, I'm trying to think, what is it even going to sound like for him to make some kind of an announcement? It's kind of weird. I don't know. It's just, it's, it's, it'll, it'll be weird if and when that happens. But the point is, it's not going to offer us any clarity on how long he's going to be here, what his mindset is for next year. You know, I mean, if he's planning on, if he's really strongly contemplating retiring this year, then we have to assume that it's going to be maybe one more year because he maybe doesn't want to be here too much longer. In which case, if we, if we believe the reports that this is some kind of a record-breaking contract, how in the freaking world? This is the thing I don't get. I want Ian Rappaport to explain this to me. Sit down with a pen and paper, Ian. Look at our salary cap situation. Draw up a short-term contract that involves, you know, $50 million a year, and we can afford it. And we cannot spread it over. So, I mean, we could do void years, that's true. But void years are not... (laughs) If it's a two-year deal with... I don't care how many void years it is, all the void years do is put it in year two. That's all it does. It's not even really necessary to do that other than to make sure you get it down as low as possible. In other words, you can structure it to put year one as low as possible, just with no void years, and then make next year just an absolute miserable existence, you know, if he leaves or whatever. But, but, but here's the thing. If it's $50 million, this is, this is what I don't get about people. They're like, well, we can restart, we could do void, we could do all the... The money is the money, and it has to get paid. And if we're just talking about two years, then $100 million, roughly, maybe not all of it gets paid out, call it 90, I don't care. $90 million is getting paid out to Aaron Rodgers. How much this year? How much next year? Well, we could get that down, man. We can get that down to like 30. It's not that big of a deal. Okay, so that means we pay 60 next year? Well, uh, no, you, you, could, you could do stuff with the salary. We could void years. I, I, I really wonder if people still think that we just pay those void years in those years. Like if you have a four void years, then for four years, we just pay on that salary. That's not how that works. The second he gets off our books, we got to pay in full. It's like returning a library book or an overdue movie. You're not getting out of there without paying the bill. Some people have no idea what I'm talking about returning movies or books for that matter. So, you know, again, there's going to be a lot of questions. And I still have no idea how in the world we're talking about record-breaking contracts and all this kind of stuff. And a lot of people have pointed out, well, Aaron Rodgers said it's not about the money. That's true, but that doesn't mean it's not going to end up being a massive contract, right? Those aren't mutually exclusive. Are you telling the Packers right now that I want the highest deal or I'm walking? No. Are you going to accept a low ball offer? No. Now, there's not a, I mean, there, there is some area in there that doesn't really make sense. I mean, if, if it's not really about the money, you kind of offer him a relatively high contract, but maybe not the highest. And if it's really not about the money, he should accept that. Because although it's technically true, where you can say, I'm not asking for it, but I'm also not going to accept anything that isn't the highest contract, that's kind of you playing stupid games with words. And if the Packers are willing to offer that, and, the, and Aaron Rodgers doesn't even want that, that also doesn't make sense. But at the very least, it can still be a very high contract, and he's not necessarily lying about, I've never gone to the Packers and said I want the highest amount of money. Technically true kind of thing. But I don't know. Again, we're just, we're just spinning our tires. We'll see what it is. By the way, um, we're just in the process of it, so I'm not exactly sure what to do. I guess in the meantime, if you see any news, any sort of insider information, in other words, somebody is predicting the future. Somebody says they have sources, and pre- I don't care if it's a... a I guess I kind of care. I don't want random accounts. But we have started the project of um, collecting insider information and and scoring them. We've kind of got a preliminary thing figured out. And now we just need some some news. And so Ian Rappaport saying that this is going to be a record-breaking contract, and you've got uh, different people saying it's definitely going to be on Tuesday or anything like that, those things all count. Or, for example, Matt Lombardo. 
fan-sided national NFL insider, host of the uh, the Matt Lombardo Show podcast. He said yesterday, As free agency looms, an interesting name expected to hit cornerback market, Razul Douglas. As it stands, sources don't expect the Packers, who are nearly $30 million over the cap, to be able to bring Douglas back. Expect multiple teams in on Douglas after a career-high five interceptions. Packers GM Brian Gutekunst praised Razul Douglas from the podium in Indianapolis, and while Green Bay seemingly would like to bring Douglas back nine days before free agency begins, I'm told there have been no talks on new deals. Now, a couple things. Number one, no idea if any of this is true whatsoever. Um, and I think a lot of people are going to try to weasel out of this kind of stuff. You know, if, if, if we signed him to a deal, he's going to get a, a incorrect mark on that. And he might be able to come, well, I never said that. that, that. No, BS. No talks. They can't afford him. You put all that stuff in your tweet. You're clearly indicating that he's about to hit free agent, the free agent market because you literally said those words. So no, you stand by it. Otherwise, this is a useless tweet. If, if you're, well, you know, I'm, I'm just going based off some information, but I never said that that would happen. No, you did. So no idea if this is true. No idea if they're going to bring him back. But do remember what I said several months ago. My assumption is a guy like Razul Douglas is probably going to price himself out of Green Bay. And it's not even necessarily because the Packers are so strapped for cash. They're in a really weird position, number one, with Stokes and, and Jair being on the team already. And I know most people are like, just put Jair in the slot. It's fine. I think that's stupid. I think it's stupid. Jair is the number one corner. I mean, can you imagine just basically taking Darrell Revis in his prime and just being like, I don't know, just throw him in the slot because we got this other guy that's pretty good. And by good, I mean, he's been historically a terrible corner who had a bunch of interceptions this year. And so, you know, people think he's, people say he's good. I'm not trying to disparage the guy, but we're getting into stupid territory where it's like, let's move Jair who is a premier corner, not because of interceptions. He actually doesn't get very many interceptions, but because he's a lockdown corner. Let's just move him into the slot. Let's just take him away from that premier number one position and just put Razul there. That way we get three, and I just want three. I think it's fine. We can have three. No, Jair is our number one guy. He's going to remain our number one guy, and he's going to be locked in on the number one guy who is not going to be in the slot. And even if he's not going, you know, not always going to just shadow the number one guy, but you're still going to be on the boundary because you're our top guy. And I'm not just going to hide you in the slot. Stokes is a first-round rookie. He played very, very well. We're excited about him. He is the future at corner. He's going to be on the boundary. What does Razul do? How much are we going to pay him to be a backup? I'm going to give him, what, $10 million? Because of one good year? With every reason to believe that there's a massive, massive regression coming? And again, exactly what I saw on Twitter is exactly what I expect. Everyone's freaking out. Oh my, I can't believe they're not going to bring him back. Why? He's going to be overpriced massively overpriced because he's going to get paid based on what he did last year and he's not going to perform like he did last year again maybe we bring him back but i don't think we are i think we're going to see that we're going to as a result say "Mm, no thank you and packers twitter is going to lose their mind you let one of the best corners in football walk out the door how dare you anytime you have a guy that has historically not been a very good football player that became a good football player because of stats that never repeat Anytime you get a guy who had one good year based on a massive amount of interceptions, never bet on that guy. The Bears did it with, uh, what's his name, the safety. They paid him a massive amount of money because he had a quote-unquote good year, which was 90% based on a million interceptions. He didn't do that the year before, and he hasn't done it since, and he's not an elite safety ever since that year. In fact, I don't know that he was that year either. He just got a bunch of interceptions. Even Tredavious White and that Buffalo Bills uh, defense, the the one year all of them were just elite. They had like, the the team had 50 billion interceptions. It was ridiculous. Everybody on the team was getting a ton of picks. Haven't done it since. And nobody's talking about their DBs much anymore. In fact, Tredavious White, I mean, people talked about him way too glowingly for way too long. But at this point, nobody talks about him anymore outside of Buffalo. Nobody's talking about Tredavious as the top corner in football. So it's not that he can't come here and have a good year, but... Okay, fine. Just like Chandon can come in and be good, but how much money are we going to pay Chandon? You going to give him like number one best corner in football, or at least you know, I was once and I deserve that amount of money, kind of money. Especially when you know teams are going to be stupid. You know somebody's going to be stupid. Somebody out there is desperate, and that's the thing. We're not desperate. We're broke, and we're not desperate. We have Jair Alexander, and we have um, Eric Stokes. I understand you need depth, but you don't need ten million dollars of depth. In one guy, or eight, or seven, or five. I don't know what he's going to ask for. You want depth? Fine. Draft a guy in the fourth round, fifth round. I don't care. Go out in free agency and get a new Razul Douglas. A guy off somebody's practice squad that nobody wants, and you turn him into a good football player. 
This is the difference between the Packers being a really good team and most teams being really garbage, and it's because fans want us to be like the garbage team. And by the way, every time we follow down the path of the garbage teams, it does never seem to pan out very well. But we got to pay these guys. I mean, come on, man. The writing's on the wall, isn't it? I mean, if he wants to come back for four million bucks, fine. If we can afford it, great. But there is certainly a line in which there's no chance I'm paying Razul Douglas. And again, I know we're a bunch of fanboys and we get excited and it's like, oh man, we, we just got the next freakish, you know, he's, he's basically Richard Sherman. And remember the good times and all that stuff. Remember the, the interception to win the game against the Cardinals. Remember the pick sixes. We remember all this stuff. And it was great. And he did great. But there's no way in the world he's going to repeat that. Nobody gets that many pick sixes just on a whim. Well, I think the system did. Yeah, I'm sure the system works better for him. Great. But again, you're talking about interceptions. Those are fleeting. So again, maybe this is a, a nonsense report. Um, I'm sure the Packers have some interest and they're putting some amount of money on the table. All I'm saying is I would not be surprised if the Packers say, here's what we think you're worth and it's going to be a reasonable amount of money. And Razul and his agent are going to look at that and say, that's offensive after what we did last year. And it might be based on what he did last year, but the Packers are not paying him for what he did last year. They're paying him for what they think he can do in the future. And Razul is wanting to get paid for what he did last year. And again, I think somebody might pay that. Maybe not in full, because I don't think any team is stupid enough to believe that this is just who he is forever. So again, the report itself is probably garbage. But even if it's garbage, it's based on intuition. And it's probably good intuition. And by the way, we're, we're probably going to be pretty busy with all this insider stuff because we've also got reports that the Packers are interested in Von Miller. And again, I think it was Ian Rappaport that might have said it. All, that, that, that doesn't mean 100% that they're going to be you know, signing a deal with, with uh, Von Miller. And, and also, you got to remember, as we've been saying now for two years or three years or whatever it is, the Packers call everybody. So it's probably, just, that's what happens this time of year, by the way. The Packers are interested in, and you're going to hear their name associated with almost everybody. Why? Because interested in, for an insider, basically means I heard that somebody called. Well, the Packers call about everybody, but guess what? You still put their name down. You still said they're interested in. That's what you said. And you can call that speculation. That's fine. That's your speculation, and I'm going to hold you to that. Also, Uchenna Nwosu, pass rusher, apparently the Packers are interested in, which again, probably just means they called, because they always call. Call everybody. They want to know what the market is, and you want to get as much uh, information as possible, which by the way, a lot of this might just have to do with signing your own guys. The Packers... Think about this. The Packers are trying to work out deals with maybe Zadarius, probably not, but also Preston, maybe Whitney Merciless. Do you think it'd be a good idea to find out what the market is for pass rushers when you're trying to re-sign pass rushers to get maximum information? So that if they say, we, well, I think based on this production, I should be worth this. And it's like, really? Because uh, I called Von Miller to see what they were wanting to get him in. And they said that they only want this. How do you think you're worth that if he's worth this? I would say your production is closer to Nwosu. And uh, we also called him and here's what he wants. There's there's no reason in the world why you wouldn't call about everybody just to get information, just to find out what people are saying. What would it take to get you in here? For trades, for everything. Tell me what it would take. Well, they can't talk to him yet. Well, okay. Well, they're talking to somebody about something. If it's not directly to the player or to the agent, you're still talking to other people and like, what is it going to, you know, what do you think it would take? You go to Indy. This is the kind of information you're grabbing. Von Miller's out there. What's he looking for, you think? Have you heard anything? And again, Ian, it gets back to Ian, and he's like, ooh, the Packers are interested in him. Not necessarily. Again, I'm going to hold you to that because you said it. And I think it's stupid because there's no way in the world we're going to pay Von Miller. I think it makes infinitely more sense that they're just gathering information. And again, especially since we're trying to work out a ton of deals with a ton of pass rushers, we need to know what the market is. The market changes every year. And I think it shifts slightly. You know, it's not just always the same percentage in other words, you can't just run the calculation every year. It probably shifts a little bit, and you just want to make sure you're staying on top of that. It's probably Russ Ball doing that work, to be completely honest. I mean, that's his job. That's entirely his job, is to work on all these contracts and stuff. So as a part of his job, he's probably gathering as much information as is humanly possible. Russ Ball's making all the calls. Unless that just tips the hat to there being no interest, so Gutekunst does it for him. I don't know, but you know what I mean? So... You can more or less ignore it. I mean, listen, if they're interested in somebody, they're probably going to call, and that means there may be um, something getting worked out. But for the vast majority of this stuff, it really just comes down to the Packers make all the calls. That's it. They, they just call. That is their process. And I love that. I love that they do that, because Ted Thompson never called anybody. And so uh, on top of not bringing in anybody, we also just didn't have the information. You know, I, I think it was, it was a... Uh, we had a very isolationist kind of policy. And, and the problem with that is if you don't open up the free market, you don't have the flow of information and the cur currency exchange, you're kind of just doing your own thing over here. You offer what you think is reasonable and they're like, dude, that's, that's trash. And it's like, that's trash? Oh, well, 
I, I, that's what we're offering. I don't know. Also, it makes you susceptible to overpaying. Now, again, I, I don't think they're stupid and they didn't have any ideas about these things, but the more information, the better. It's not going to hurt. Anyways, seems like a good spot to take a break, so why don't we go ahead and do that? Remember, pinned to the top of my Twitter, you can help Drew out. He's trying to get himself a seizure service dog. He was diagnosed with epilepsy, so we're trying to, as a community, come together and help him out. Remember, we're also helping out with uh, Jamie and Carter's accident. You can find that pinned to the top of the Packernet Podcast Facebook group. And again, if you just want that, you don't feel like joining Facebook or whatever, or Twitter, just reach out and I'll, I'll get you the links when I can. Finally, don't forget about amodernfrontier.com, where you can get yourself some beef, some get, get yourself some pork. Uh, they've also got a uh, something like a butcher's dozen beef box or something, a ground beef box, basically. So if you're in the market to just get some some meat at, at pretty affordable prices when you factor what's going on at the grocery store right now, it's, it's actually quite reasonable to just buy meat, <laughs> especially when you're getting it direct from a farm and everything else. The prices don't inflate uh, quite the same way when you do a little bit more farm-to-table stuff. But uh, remember to use promo code MEATPACKER, one word, all caps, you get $25 off your order. We'll take a break and we'll be right back. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. So the biggest news, and I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about it, um, but the biggest news has to do with Calvin Ridley. He got a one-year suspension for um, gambling on football games. And there's a lot of uh, people that are upset because, you know, domestic violence and, and, you know, violent offenders, people that do stuff like that, don't seem to get the same kind of punishments. And I think that's fair, and I think that that's true. Um, I, I think we overgeneralize and oversimplify things. I think there are mitigating circumstances. For example, in a lot of those cases, the, the charges get dropped. And so although we kind of look at it and go, yeah, you did it, though, you know, what are you supposed to do? There's no legal charges. So, it, I mean, it is complicated. And then if you bring the hammer down, you're going to get absolutely crucified because you're, you're punishing a guy that the court system has said did nothing wrong. You know, it's, it's sort of like the Deshaun thing where, you know, there's, if you just look in the comment section, there's, there's two different sides of this. On one side, people are saying, this guy should not even be in the league after what he did. And then you got other people saying, um, show me the charges. Show me where he was convicted of anything. It's not fair to punish a guy who's never been convicted of anything. But generally speaking, I, I think there's a lot of truth in it. Um, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't want to get into it because it, it's not something that I would like to be a part of. I, I, I think that the thing is we need to be more, and even that's kind of a, a, a tough thing too, because on one hand, you don't want it to be just general sweeping punishments. When you look at what he did, it's not that big of a deal. I think he should be suspended just, at, just to send a message to the rest of the league. We don't want other guys doing this. Because if you start allowing it, that becomes a problem. So there needs to be a punishment. But at the same time, you look at it and go, okay, what did you bet on? Well, I bet on other teams, and I also bet on the Falcons to win. So there's no real conflict of interest. If he ever bets on the Falcons to lose, big-time suspensions. But he didn't. So there's no reason to believe there's any kind of conflict of interest here. 
you don't have any reason to believe there's a player throwing games, which is really the, the biggest concern is that the integrity of the product and, and worrying that some of these players might be throwing games, which is kind of silly because he bet like 1500 bucks. I mean, it's not like he bet $10 million the Falcons would lose and then was like out there, you know, beach volleyballing the ball up in the air trying to get interceptions like, oops, I dropped it. Oh man, he picked it again. Runs down the field, blocks his own guy on accident. A trip, man. I'm sorry. Oh, they got another. This defense is killing us, dude. It's crazy. Can't believe we were favored and we're losing. We almost are never favored. That's crazy. So we should have that ability to, um, you know, think through things and not just have blanket sweeping like, well, if you bet on games, you get a one-year suspension. That's just the rule. But at the same time, if we do that, and again, this is where we, we, we're going to complain no matter what, and we, we play both sides of these things. Another thing that we've all complained about, myself included, is that Roger Goodell has way too much leeway to just be like, I think I'll choose this today. And he just pulls random punishments out of thin air. So I think what we want is for him to have the freedom to execute justice, but to do it perfectly. Right? He should have the ability to, or the league should in general, have some thought to come up with the right punishment, but we want it to be the right punishment. And again, I I think the problem is we're imperfect in how we view things as well. Right, if there's even an accusation against somebody where, where there's no legal charges, well, we've decided in the court of public opinion that he's guilty and he probably did it, therefore he should be out of the league, period. Because we don't tolerate that. Tolerate what? He didn't do anything. Well, yes, he didn't. How dare you? How dare you say he didn't? I don't care what the court said. You know what I mean? I, I, it's, it's, not, it's not as easy as we're trying to make it out to be. Although, again, I'm sure if we sat down and thought about it, which I have not, we can come up with something that isn't quite as crazy as everyone else is pointing out, you know, so-and-so got four games for beating up this person and that person. And again, you know, as I've said, the NFL doesn't care about any of this stuff. They don't care about, they just care about what's going to hurt their pocketbook. And for some reason, and, and this, this clearly has something to do with us, you know, it's kind of like we, we don't like certain commercials, this, that, or the other, but we get pandered to in the way that we want to be pandered to. So everything that's around us right now in this very commercial environment is because of us. And so when domestic violence isn't punished very strongly and we get mad about it. The reason it's not punished very strongly is because they know we're going to get over it. That guy's going to play, he's going to co- score touchdowns, and we're going to cheer. Aside from like a, a random batch of people on Twitter who are going to complain about it. And for the most part, though, nothing's going to happen. Right? His, his jersey sales are probably going to dip because nobody's going to want to associate with that, but people will move on. And if that wasn't the case, these people would be out of the league. That's just the reality. Because they're, they just go with the wind. Same, same thing I said with COVID. They have no interest in shutting down their own league because of COVID. They don't. I don't think very many of these guys, I mean, some of them were. Obviously, the Vikings coach was super worried about COVID. <laughs> I'm sure a few others were. But, you know, the, the owners and whatnot, a lot of these guys, I doubt Roger Goodell cared very much. But they went along with what public perception said you should do. And if, if they just said, I don't really care about COVID, or what, it would have been a massive firestorm. And so now, now that people don't seem to care as much, and some people are still going to be psycho about COVID for the rest of their lives, and they're never going to get over it, but they know that public perception has shifted to the point where you can make all this stuff that they don't want go away, and there will be less negative than there will be positive. Most people will be happy about it, at least enough so that they can do what they want and get away with it. Because that's all they, again, they, they, they just genuinely don't care. And, and the, the biggest example I have of that is, is one of the most egregious things I've seen was the video of Joe Mixon knocking a woman out in a restaurant. And in a matter of like a month or two, he got drafted in the second round and has been playing in the NFL ever since. And he's got selling tons of jerseys and all the announcers praise him as being a great running back. And nobody cares about Joe Mixon. Nobody says a word about him. The last time you talked about Joe Mixon, was it about his talent as a football player? Or was it about the fact that he shouldn't even be in the NFL because he's, he, he, I think he broke the woman's jaw. And there was a video of it. It was, it was gruesome. He knocked her out cold right in the middle of a restaurant. I think he broke her jaw and she just went flat on the floor and he walked right out. And, and, and his punishment was he fell to the second round. That was his punishment. So it's not about caring. Nobody cares. I shouldn't say nobody cares. The, the, the NFL generally doesn't care. It's just a matter of what can we, what, what is the minimum we can do to make it seem like we did something. And I, I know that's a, a, a bleak way of looking at it, but in reality, what else are we talking about here? If this was a league, and, and it's not just the league, I'm sorry to tell you, I know we want to believe that society is built on these, these angels and we all collectively just love and are peaceful and we're just great human beings. 
And the NFL is this evil, rich billionaire. It's, that's a fantasy. The evil, rich billionaires can do it because the society as a whole doesn't give a crap. We pretend to, and then we move on, just like everything else. If you don't believe me, look at all the political scandals you personally don't care about. You pretend to care about political scandals when the party that you don't like does it, and then when your own party does it, you pretend it doesn't even matter. Because a lot of this stuff is fake outrage. And it's kind of sad, but that's the reality. The NFL can offer a six-game suspension to a guy that beat the living daylights out of somebody because they know that although there's going to be some huffing and puffing and how dare you, and it's only six games, it's it's going to be the same thing every single time. There's going to be a bunch, oh, six, and they're going to go through the list. Six games for this, but Calvin Ridley got a year for gambling. Wow, what a, da, da, da. And we're going to go through that little rigmarole, and then it's going to, we're just going to move on, and we're going to move on, and that's it. Adrian Peterson to this day is just praise. I can't believe, oh yeah, he's going to this team. Da, 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 da. We moved on. Aside from, again, a handful of people like, oh, remember when he did this? And again, you look in the comments of that, and it's going to be like, oh, where was the conviction? Oh, where was da, da, da. I don't remember the specifics of that, but there's, there's always people defending it. So, I mean, I don't know that I necessarily dislike the year suspension, aside from the fact that there really wasn't a conflict of interest. And I think if you wanted to send a message, you could do so with less time. That is a massive, and it, it, it kind of seems like a nip it in the bud kind of thing. In other words, we haven't really had this happen before, and we want to make sure it never happens again, so we're making an example of him, which I don't like when people do that. That's completely wrong. Like, this isn't a fair punishment, but we're making an example of you. That's, that's a human being, dude. You have no right to over-punish somebody just to try to prevent other people. I, I hate that so much. Making laws as, as a, a way of dissuading people or punishments as a way of dissuading other people is always wrong. Always wrong. And I think that's what they're doing here. And that is wrong. It's not about what you did. It's about preventing other people from doing what you did and worse and allowing this to get out of control. So we're going to bring the hammer down as fast and as violently as possible to prevent this from ever happening again. And I think that's as deep as they thought about it. And I don't think they care that they've given out smaller suspensions for for domestic violence, which, by the way, is much more common than gambling, if you can believe that. And if they start handing out one year or permanent suspensions for everybody that raised their hand to somebody, they'd be in a little bit of trouble and they're just not going to do that. So again, it's not, good, it's not a good thing, but it's the reality. And it's not just the evil rich billionaires. They can get away with it because society will move on. And you know that's true. It sucks, and it's sad, but it's a reality. If you don't believe me, again, look at Deshaun Watson. We just keep talking like he didn't do anything wrong. Oh, the Miami Dolphins are interested. Oh, they're not interested anymore, but look at Washington. The commanders, they're super interested. They might make a push for them. Like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, what happened... To the accusation, well, there's no, we don't really know yet, so the, the media talks about Deshaun Watson like he's just this, the most talented guy in the world just waiting out there, and there's no other information in that story. He's just super talented, and he's just waiting. Somebody's going to get a superstar. I wonder who it's going to be. Could it be, you know, who's going to be the lucky winner? <laughs> what happened to the part where he assaulted numerous people? What happened to that? Oh, we don't, we don't talk about that. We're, 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 just, we're just trying to talk about a talented football player, ma- you know, making some good throws, man. Just, just dropping dimes. Okay. All right. So we've moved on. Got it. Well, there's no trouble. And, and again, then we, then we want to bounce back and forth. Well, you know, if there's no da-da-da. Okay, well, then that applies to all the, the domestic abusers whose um, girlfriends that are terrified of them end up saying, oh, no, he didn't actually do that. I made that up. Those cases get dropped, too, sometimes. Are we, are we just going to say, well, there's no, you know, he didn't get convicted. So again, it's, it's more complicated than we make it. We want to just, you know, broad sweeping judgments, but this is also stupid, but it's also stupid because we make it stupid. So it's just a ugly, stupid mess of stupidity and ugliness and more stupidity on top of that. But that's just the way it is. And that's not going to change. So you're not going to find me on Twitter tweeting what everybody else is twi- tweeting, because again, I think it's overly simplified nonsense with strains of truth. But again, for all the reasons I listed, it's just not even worth engaging with because it's just, it's just, it's just a tired thing at this point. This is going to keep happening. People who did very little are going to get suspended for a long time because there's some weird little thing. And then people who did really egregious things for various reasons are not going to get that serious because, well, we don't actually know. And, <laughs> and then you're going to get all the tweets and all the lists of, look at this guy got this and this guy got this and that guy got this. And it's like, yeah, I know. And I don't want to look it up to see what the circumstances are because, again, it doesn't matter because it's not going to change anything. Anyways, um, really quickly moving off that, I want to do some uh, drafty, drafty stuff. So 
if you are a patron and you're at that $5 tier, I have started the process of just doing some very brief, I mean, it's not super detailed or anything, but just sort of here's who they are and here's my brief opinion on them. I've done two players so far. I did Chris Olave and I did George Pickens. By the way, we're, we're finally starting to see the movement on this. I, I just I just noticed it, and it's it's very, very real. So Garrett Wilson is staying where he was at the top spot at number 11. Jamison Williams, because of his uh, combines and whatnot, moved up two spots to 16. Chris Olave, who, again, the Packers had at 28, is now projected to go 16 to the Eagles. He's now 19th overall. He's jumped up three spots. Drake London and Traylon Burks, though, Two guys that I really like, and I'll probably do them next because now they're becoming in range. Drake London has dropped five spots down to 22. Traylon Burks has dropped nine spots down to 24. Now, again, this doesn't mean this is what NFL teams think. And we still got pro days. Traylon Burks did not have great 40 time, all that kind of stuff. It may just been the conditions, this, that, or the other. He was expected to run a lot faster, though. And so you've got a guy that is just kind of big, strong, physical, sort of an Alan Lazard type. But the assumption was he's also really fast. He's running in the 4.4s or something, and he ran in the 4.5s. So he has dropped nine spots. Somehow Jahan Dotson has moved up two spots. I don't know how that happened. George Pickens is up four spots. David Bell is starting to drop, um, et cetera, et cetera. So you're starting to see that kind of movement. And a lot of this, again, is is somewhat expected. Chris Olave with a big jump. Drake London, who didn't run, so we'll see. He may bounce back with a real strong pro day. If he runs fast at his size, he'll be fine. Um, And again, Traylon dropping a ton. We should actually, let me look at this real quick. That's right, I forgot uh, the guy who owns the site said there's a big uh, a big update coming. So Malik Willis, looking at quarterbacks real quick, we'll just do the top guys. Malik Willis is up three spots to nine. So he is in the top 10. Again, this is not based on the NFL, but this is now the media consensus. Kenny Pickett is actually up four spots. I don't know how that happened. Matt Corral has dropped five spots. Good, you guys are idiots, I don't care. And then Sam Howell, Desmond Ritter have not moved. Running back, um, Brees Hall has not moved up, but I expect he might. He's already at 48. I don't know if he bounces in the first round, but there's some possibility. You're starting to see comps to guys like Saquon Barkley and Jonathan Taylor based on his size and speed. Um, Isaiah Spiller is falling because of his not great times. And then you got Kenneth, Kenneth Walker moving up three spots. Kyron Williams moving up six spots. Brian Robinson has actually moved up eight spots, the Alabama, the bigger Alabama guy. So a lot of big movements here. At tight end, Trey McBride has not really moved, which kind of makes sense. Um, Jalen Weidermeyer has moved up four spots to 53. Isaiah Likely has moved up 11 spots. Jeremy Ruckert is down three. Uh, Charlie Kohler is down three. And then Cade Otten moved up 16 spots up to 107. So a lot of upward mobility for a lot of these guys. Some of them haven't really moved yet, probably because they're just not on lists. You know, Jake, if you do a top 100 list and Jake Ferguson isn't on it, then he's not going to go up or down. But uh, Jelani Woods has moved up eight spots to 170. So these are these are big jumps. Usually in a day, you move up like one or two spots because it's because it's an aggregate. So if you've got you know 20, if you're looking at 20 boards that you're on and you move up eight spots because of one new addition, you must have moved way up on that one board. And so for that reason, I as we start to move away from the older boards and move into the newer boards, I think these bigger jumps are going to continue, and we'll just see how how uh, drastic they are. Um, looking at offensive tackle, the top three guys have not moved. you got Evan Neal at two, Hakema Kwanu at four, and Charles Cross at seven. Those are all kind of expected top 10 guys. Trevor Penning has moved up two spots so far to 25. Otherwise, not a ton. Uh, Daniel Fealele moved up three spots. Petit Frere moved down two spots. Sean Ryan moved up 11 spots. Max Mitchell dropped six. Uh, Rashid Walker up 12. Tyler Smith up 12. Interior offensive line, uh, the top three guys, Tyler Linderbaum, Kenyon Green, and Zion Johnson have not moved, but Jamari Salyer, Georgia interior offensive lineman, moved up nine spots, while Dylan Parham uh, went down four, Ed Ingram went down four, and Thayer Munford went down four. It seems like everybody at Ohio State is dropping right now. Um, Then you've got defensive line, obviously, these... um, Georgia boys are moving. Devontae Wyatt, not so much, but Trayvon Walker, who they list as a defensive lineman, he's a pass rusher, but he's moved up five spots to 23. That's going to continue. There's talk about him being a top 10 pick for sure. He's at 23. That's going to continue upward. Jordan Davis, kind of the same thing. He also jumped up five spots. He's at 18 right now. I don't know how high he's going to go. Somebody asked me if if he was going to be in the top 10, and I'm not positive of that. I think most people assume he is because of his freakish, I mean, again, second most freaky athlete since Calvin Johnson. You have to assume that's top 10 talent. 
But I still look at guys like Vita Vea that go in around 12. I mean, if he goes outside of the top 10, he'll go very soon within, you know, 11, 12, 13. I, I said he, he, no chance he gets outside of the top 15. I don't know for sure he goes in the top 10. It just seems like those massively big physical freaks that are 340 pounds, they don't go top 10, they go top 15. Now, I know he's, he's, he's more athletic than all those guys, so he may crack the top 10. You could even say probably crack the top 10, but I don't know for sure. But those guys are moving up. Uh, nothing from uh, Wyatt, Leal, Hall, Jones. Uh, Federian Math has moved up too. Perry and Winfrey moved up 10 spots. So, again, a lot of big-time movement. Um, off the edge, Karloftis dropped three spots. So you got Aiden Hutchinson, number one. Kayvon Thibodeau, number three. David Ajabo is ranked 10th. Karloftis is down to 13th. Jermaine Johnson moved up two spots to 17. Drake Jackson just continues to drop. He moved down four more spots. He was a first-round pick at one point. He has continued his downward trend. My J. Sanders is up three. Nick Bonito up three. These are guys that had great um, combines. Kingsley Enigbare dropped 13 spots. At linebacker, nobody at the top has really moved, but also a lot of these guys didn't run. Christian Harris did. He had a great combine. He may move slightly back up. Uh, we'll see how that goes. But the first guy that moved is um, Damone Clark, LSU, moved up eight spots. Then you got a bunch of guys. Uh, Chanel actually dropped. I don't know. Some of these are kind of random, but. Uh, Darian Beavers moved up 12 spots. He leapfrogged several guys because you got a bunch of guys in this, you know, 90 to 100 range. So he just leapfrogged Chanel, Channing Tindall, Troy Anderson, Brian Asamoa, and then finally Jojo Doman, whoever that is, linebacker out of Nebraska, moved up 17 spots. So it's kind of cool, man. It's, it's it's fun. And for those of us that have been doing mock drafts and everything else, we've been kind of getting repetitive, same old stuff all the time. These mock drafts are going to look very different starting now. Uh, cornerback Derek Stingley starting to fall. He's still sitting at ten he, or at eight. He only dropped two spots. Um, I'm expecting him to continue that drop. Uh, Gardner is number one cornerback at six. Andrew Booth is at 26. Trent McDuffie dropped two spots to 27. Otherwise, most people are staying about the same. Darian Kendrick out of Georgia dropped ten spots. Kobe Bryant out of Cincinnati dropped seven. So a, all these corners are basically just dropping. The only guy that went up is uh, Mario Goodrich who's at 108. He dropped, He went up 16 spots. Safety's not a lot going on here. There's questions about whether Kyle Hamilton will drop because of his uh, 40 time, although his, his athleticism is still great, but his 40 time is not. And I think people worry about that with safeties because you worry about sideline to sideline speed. Um, but he's, I mean, he's not slow. It's just not as fast as people were thinking. But Kyle Hamilton, Daxton Hill, Jaquan Brisker are the top three. They've all stayed the same. Lewis Seen out of Georgia has dropped, but Jalen Petrie, out of Baylor, has moved up 13 spots. So he is now uh, safety five. And then Kirby Joseph is, after that, he dropped five spots. And we've actually got some mobility on special teams we haven't even talked about, which we may want to. Um, the number, everybody stayed the same except the number two kicker, Cameron Dicker. Dicker the kicker. Can probably go a bunch of other places with that, but we'll leave it at that. Moved up 16 spots, but he's still sitting at 322. So we're still potentially talking about undrafted free agent territory, which is great because, you know, we may be looking for a kicker and I'd rather not draft one if possible. Um, Puncher, the top guy, dropped two spots. So, uh, you know, if you care that much, Matt Areza, punter out of uh, San Diego State. No movement at long snapper, which actually matters to us. But uh, there's only two guys listed here. Cal Adomitis, Pittsburgh, and Jordan Silver out of Arkansas. But there were a bunch of mock drafts that were done yesterday, so I want to just go through a couple of them just to look at um, kind of where things are at right now. Again, I, I mentioned yesterday things are starting to change, um, but we'll just have to see how this goes. The first mock draft, this was done by Sports Illustrated. There's a bunch of Sports Illustrated ones. This was Matt DeLima, and J.J. Leahy is going to be really excited about this, although I don't even think he would support this pick necessarily. But with the 28th pick, he has the Green Bay Packers selecting tight end Jeremy Ruckert out of Ohio State. So very, very unusual pick. I don't know that there was necessarily anything at the combine that would, I mean, even move him up the boards, much less uh, push him into the first round. But um, again, you're starting to see different crazy stuff. So different things to uh, pay attention to. You also got Rick Saratella over at uh, sportsillustrated.com. He has the Packers taking Jamison Williams, wide receiver out of Alabama. 
He says, a move that could make sense on numerous levels, whether Devontae Adams returns or not, the Packers need another weapon. Williams would be a mid-season turbo boost for the offense. So maybe I'll try to get that one in also today, get three of them done, Jamison Williams, uh, Drake London, and Traylon Burks, just so we can kind of get the wide receivers off the board here. Uh, John McCarron, another Sports Illustrated article, has the Packers taking cornerback Ahmad Gardner. Again, kind of ridiculous, almost as ridiculous as Gard- as uh, Ruckert was because he's expected to be a top 10 guy. But I just, I, I, I just love this because we need to do this. We need to be able to think outside the box. We need to be able to think what if. We can't just look at mock draft after mock draft after mock draft of picking between two different wide receivers or three different wide receivers. We can't do that. And so again, it, it, it forces you to think, okay, let's say there was some kind of an issue. Let's say Ahmad Gardner did fall. You think they would do it? I know we've got two corners, but we need more. And, and, and again, I don't, I don't think we should be investing another first-round pick. That's what somebody else would say. Well, you can never have too many corners. Well, you can because if, if you know, there's two wide receivers out there, then we're going to put two corners out there. So we're talking about a guy that's sitting on the bench. And if he's not a slot guy, it doesn't even matter if they have three guys out there. I understand depth, but you don't spend a first-round pick on depth, which I guess is my issue with this. But it is, it is at least a question. Would they maybe put Jair in the slot? I don't like that plan, but it doesn't mean the Packers don't like it. Maybe they love that plan. Let's get another free corner. And we got three first round freaks on the field. Kind of a semi-similar, uh, similar but more realistic mock by Ryan Wilson of CBS. Um, he has the Packers at 28, taking Andrew, B- Andrew Booth the corner. He says, Andrew Booth, B- why can I not say Booth? Andrew Booth had a strong 21 season for Clemson, and he's only going to get better with experience. In Green Bay, Jair Alexander is entering his final year of his rookie deal, and while Eric Stokes had a strong rookie campaign, you can never have enough good young cornerbacks. Again, I I freaking hate that with a passion. Yes, you can. I'm going to fight Ryan Wilson. I'm going to fight him. I'm going to punch him in the face and force him to admit there is a number that's too many. I probably don't even have to hit him to do that, but I just, I just want to fight him, all right? I don't care if I lose the fight. I, it just it needs to happen. I can't tolerate this anymore. You can never have enough. You can never have enough corners. You can never have enough tackles. You can never have enough pass rushers. Shoot, you can never have enough good defensive tackles. You can never have enough good quarterbacks. I, don't, I mean, that's not a thing people say, but why not? It's the most important position in football. Well, how can you have too many quarterbacks? Well, because only one plays. Exactly, you idiot. What do you want, nine first-round corners? What are we going to do with them? What are you going to do with them? It's stupid. Stop saying that. Again, maybe. But don't say you can never have enough. Don't say that. 74 is too many. In fact, the NFL will come to you and tell you you have too many. They have to go bye-bye. You don't get to say, well, you can never have too many. I, somebody told me, can I keep my 74 corners? Are you even paying them? Yeah, because they're all trash, undrafted free agent, but you can never have too many young corners. (laughs) Hate it. Moving on to a draft countdown. This is Shane Halam. He has the Green Bay Packers taking wide receiver Chris Olave. Now, this is a, I don't want to just tell you everything that I said on, um, on Patreon because that kind of defeats the purpose of Patreon, but I'll just say this. I like Chris Olave. I don't think he's the guy. I don't know that he's a true X number one wide receiver. I'm sure everyone's going to disagree with that. That's fine. If I had to put money down today that he's going to be like a, a Devontae Adams or you know any, any of these top guys, first of all, they usually don't look like Chris Olave. He, there, there are some really solid number two guys, you know, the speed guys on the other side, like, you know, Calvin Ridley and whatnot. I think he could be that. I think he could be, who's that guy that I was obsessed with forever? Um, he keeps bouncing around. He was with Tampa for a long time. S- smaller speed guy that just kind of crushes wherever he goes, and I want him, but the Packers just never get him because they don't like guys like Chris Olave. He could be that. If you don't know who I'm talking about, that's fine because apparently I don't either. I just, I don't know that he can be that guy. And beyond that, I just, I don't, it doesn't scream Packers receiver to me. When I look at him, it's like, I like him. I like what he does, but I don't think the Packers are going to be like, that's our guy. I just, I don't see that. Mock from uh, Pro Football Network has the Packers taking edge rusher Boye Mafe out of Minnesota. Another completely wild one, but, you know, again, you got the combine. People got all kinds of thoughts and opinions on stuff. He's currently sitting at 74th overall, so he's kind of a third-round guy. That would be even a reach for the Packers, but 
Here's what he had to say. Boye Mafe's stock has increased exponentially since the start of the offseason, and all along the way, we've been asking ourselves just how high can this guy go. At this point, you can't tell me with 100% confidence he won't go in round one. I'm not sure it happens, but I do know this. Mafe is a stellar character off the field. He dominated the Senior Bowl. Those are two very important Packers qualities there. And he is a quantifiably elite athlete, another checkbox for the Packers. All the ingredients for a first-round ascent are there. Testing with the linebackers, Mafe earned an RAS of exactly 10. And if you switch him to defensive end, he'd still have an RAS of 9.91 at 6'4", 261 pounds. Mafe has a torrid 4'5", 340-yard dash, a 38-inch vert, and a 125-inch broad jump. Talent is an important accelerating factor for Mafe's rise, but team fit could be just as important. The Packers prefer large rushers in the 260-plus range. Not only does Mafe offer that, but has elite... who. Uh, he's an elite athlete who's only scratching the surface. I like this. I mean, I don't, I don't know if the pick is right, but he even says that. I don't know if he's going to go that high, but I appreciate the amount of effort he put in. Some of these picks are just stupid, and they don't even defend it. I mean, how lazy can these writers be? You can't write like two sentences to explain your pick. That's pure laziness. This was in-depth, two paragraphs for each team in each pick, and all of those things checked all the boxes. So I respect that pick a lot. Speaking of lazy, DraftKings put together a mock. They have the Packers taking Jahan Dotson. Um, Have not looked at Jahan. I mean, I have, but not in depth. I haven't done like a a write-up on him or anything. But I think it's going to be like Olave, but just a guy that's not as good. It's a a wide receiver that I'm probably going to like to some degree, but the Packers are never going to touch him. Uh, NFL Mox has Green Bay Packers taking Drake Jackson, edge rusher out of USC. Again, he's dropping so far. I'm guessing... It's not going to happen. Now, again, if he's a second-round guy, maybe the Packers will be interested, but I think they generally are looking at risers, not fallers. So they might reach into the second round, but they're not going after a guy that was a first-round pick and is falling his way to the third round. However, here's what he had to say. The Green Bay Packers could get Preston Smith back for 2022, but that might not deter them from selecting an edge rusher in the first round of the 2022 NFL draft. That's absolutely correct, especially in a deep class, it says, which is another important point. Drake Jackson will turn 21 in April. It's another check mark for the Packers. They like young players for obvious reasons and could have his best football ahead of him in the NFL. Jackson is a great speed rusher who can turn the corner but needs to put on some weight and add to his power profile to be a three-down player in the NFL. So fair enough. He defended it in an adequate way. And then finally, we have, uh, who did this one? It's Walter Football. Is it Charlie or Walter? I believe this is Charlie Campbell that did this one. These guys do a ton of work, so this is a surprising pick, but we'll we'll give him the... I'm, I'm one of the few people that still really likes Walter Football. Everyone seems to think that they're trash, but I think that they actually do their their job. With the 28th pick, they have them selecting Wandale Robinson, wide receiver out of Kentucky. Here's what Charlie had to say. Even if Devontae Adams is retained, Green Bay could use more young wide receiver talent. Robinson was phenomenal for Kentucky in 2021, catching 104 passes for 1334 yards and seven touchdowns. The 5'11", 185-pounder transferred to Nebraska and took the SEC by storm. Some team sources feel Robinson is a better version of Brandon Cooks. Like Cooks, Robinson is an outside speed receiver who is a threat to burn defenses vertically. Robinson is similar to Tyreek Hill as well, but not as fast as Hill. Some sources think Robinson will be a better version of Cooks in the NFL. I think he repeated that. Robinson is a fabulous route runner with speed and sudden out of breaks. He's a real asset to uncover quickly for his quarterback. So this would be our number two speed threat. It's not who I would have circled for a lot of reasons. Number one, he's expected to go later, like third round later. Number two, he's much smaller. 5'11", 185 is small, although that's basically Chris Olave size. But again, another really rare pick for the Packers in the first round. And at this point, I just appreciate it. You know, I, I don't like stupid for the sake of stupid, but I also really get tired of the same repetitive nonsense. So definitely appreciate that. But that's just, again, just trying to keep track of where things are at and also being able to look at uh, prospects, get familiar with the names and their draft profiles, et cetera, et cetera. And again, if you really are interested in uh, what I think about some of these prospects, I'm going to try to do at least two a day. Today, I'm going to try to get three at a minimum. Um, there's there's some information there that I put, just basic whatever. I, I just attach their RAS because there's no point in me typing all that stuff up. You can just click on it. It's a resource. And then I, I attach two pictures to it. So you can see their PFF grades over their career and the PFF grades for the last year that they played, presumably 2021 if they did. So that alone is is pretty interesting. And then below that, I will, well, I'll also put where they rank currently. Um, I'm not going to keep updating that every whatever, but it'll be on the date that I did it. Where are they currently ranked positionally as well as um, overall? And then I'll give my general thoughts real quick paragraph or two on just my general thoughts on the player. So again, that's the $5 tier on Patreon if you're interested. 
But otherwise, you guys have yourselves a fantastic day. I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.